the reactor would run very rapidly, and I mean very rapidly, within a second or so, out of control. At Hanford in North America, there was a special 30-mile-long escape road built as part of the safety precautions. And we decided this country was far too small to have a reactor with such dangerous possibilities built anywhere, uh, not even in Scotland. But the British scientists believed they'd found the answer. To cool the huge reactor, batteries of fans drive air through a ventilating system around it. Windscale's graphite core would be cooled not with water, but with air, blown through the core by huge fans and taking the heat up and out through enormous chimneys. It convinced them that it would be safe to build a reactor next to Seascale. And work continued on Britain's most ambitious engineering project. But the reactor was not being built as Christopher Hinton wanted. He faced a deadline imposed on him by politicians. They demanded that Britain should be a nuclear power by 1952, the same year the Soviet Union was expected to have the bomb. For such new and untried science, it was a horrendous deadline to meet. The development work that should have been done at Harwell was all cut short by the extreme political and military pressure on them, the, the very, very tight deadlines that were given. With time so short, building had begun before the research work was complete. A year into construction, a scientist at Harwell made a devastating discovery. Construction was well on the way, and the air was going to be discharged up at chimneys, 400 feet high. I think in the early summer of uh, 1948, uh, I doodled uh, on a piece of paper about asking myself what would happen if one uranium uh, rod were to catch fire. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't but much like the answer. Price realised that if an aluminium mm. cartridge burst, the uranium could burn and the powerful air cooling system would blow radioactive dust up the chimney. There was nothing to stop radioactivity blowing out over sea scale and beyond. So I went to the next committee uh, meeting and said that I think that it would be desirable to filter the air coming out of the chimney. Uh, and it went down like an absolute lead balloon. The chairman leant back in the chair and said, don't be so silly, lad. Two tons of air go up chimney every second, can't filter that. Yeah, and it was considered such a fatuous remark that it didn't, doesn't even appear in the minutes of the meeting. Many thought filters would be an unnecessary delay, but John Cockcroft backed Price and ordered massive concrete filters to be winched 400 feet and attached to the top of the chimneys. That is why the filters are known as Cockcroft's Follies. At least they were. Uh, the word folly did not seem appropriate after the accident. It was a warning for Hinton. In Whitehall, meeting the deadline for the bomb was more important than the safety of the reactor. Hinton never took any chances with safety because of this pressure, uh, but he was really having to work almost hand, from hand to mouth. But the shortcuts taken with safety would later haunt the man who built Windscale. In 1951, after five years of back-breaking work, Windscale was built, just 10 days behind schedule. This is the Windscale reactor, hung about with ladders like Gulliver in Liverpool. Hinton had achieved what many had thought was impossible in such a short time. Windscale is unique. It is science fiction intruding on our sober lives. And it is a very great producer of plutonium. It was true, Windscale could produce plutonium. 
just not enough for the bomb. It was at the research laboratory at Harwell that scientists realized that the uranium cartridges weren't producing enough plutonium. The only way for Windscale to increase plutonium output was to heat the uranium even more. And the only way to do that was to reduce the amount of aluminium casing around the uranium. The problem was that the cartridges had been manufactured and were already inside the reactor. Then Windscale's deputy general manager, Tom Tui, came up with an answer. Tom Tui was a most impressive character. He was pretty young for his senior post. He uh, largely ran it, I think, and he was extremely dominant. He got a finger on every part of the, of the site and was very full of energy. Uh, he was a lively, handsome man, sort of bold features and a mass of gorgeous auburn hair flowing back from his forehead. Tui simply took the cartridges out and trimmed off some of the aluminium, the fins. This meant unloading the 102 tonnes, clipping one-sixth of an inch of aluminium off every fin, of which there were 14 on each of 36,000 fuel elements, which meant we had to do about a half a million fins. And one of our engineers devised a, a, a little machine whereby you could place this on a rack and turn it round, and you made a stroke like that, clipped your fin, turned it round, clipped another, turned it round, clipped another, and we managed to get the whole half million fins off, as I say, in, in three weeks. It was a classic case of British make, do and mend, but it meant one of Windscale's safety features had been removed. Opinion at the reactor was split. Well, there were two schools of thought. They were proud of the fact that they were producing plutonium at, the, at whatever, at the faster rate maybe, as, or, or meeting the targets that had been set for them and so on and so on, and they were doing it in a, in definitely as they saw it, there was, was a national interest. Gung-ho, queen and country stuff, you know. There was another very significant group who were extremely concerned about the attitude towards the um, possible dangers from radiation and so on and so on. The warnings were ignored. Nothing was allowed to delay the production of plutonium. And in August 1952, the first plutonium left Windscale to become part of Britain's atom bomb. I broke down the reaction vessel myself personally, opened it up, scrambled around amongst calcium fluoride to see if I could find anything. And there I found a piece of plutonium about this size, but the size of a 50 pence piece. 132 grams, and that was our very first piece. So all this vast industrial complex and six years of activity came down to 132 grams of plutonium. Hinton had done his job. Now it was the turn of William Penny. Seven years after helping the Americans build their bomb, Penny gathered his team for the crucial bomb test in Australia. The pressure was on Penny. Britain had a new prime minister, the man who had invented the phrase special relationship. Churchill was determined that Penny's atom bomb would restore Britain's standing with the Americans. Never shall we lose our faith and courage, and never shall we fail in exertion and resolve. And the word went round that on the permanent secretary's desk in the Minister of Supply, there were two forms. Uh, and one said, hard luck, Dr. Penny. The other said, congratulations, Sir William. 